Phaedrus's argument for the abolition of the degree and grading system produced a nonplussed or negative reaction in all but a few students at first, since it seemed, on first judgment, to destroy the whole university system. One student laid it wide open when she said with complete candor, of course you can't eliminate the degree and grading system. After all, that's what we're here for. She spoke the complete truth. The idea that the majority of students attend a university for an education independent of the degree and grades is a little hypocrisy everyone is happier not to expose. Occasionally, some of the students do arrive for an education, but wrote and the mechanical nature of the institution soon converts them to a less idealistic attitude. The demonstrator was an argument that elimination of grades and degrees would destroy this hypocrisy. Rather than deal with generalities, it dealt with the specific career of an imaginary student who more or less typified what was found in the classroom, a student completely conditioned to work for a grade rather than for the knowledge the grade was supposed to represent. Such a student, the demonstrator hypothesized, would go to his class first, get his first assignment, and probably do it out of habit. He might go to his second, and his third as well. But eventually the novelty of the course would wear off, and because of his academic life, was not his only life, the pressure of other obligations or desires would create circumstances where he just would not be able to get an assignment in. Since there was no degree or grading system, he would incur no penalty for this. Subsequent lectures which presumed he had completed, the assignment might be a little more difficult to understand. However, this difficulty in turn might weaken his interest to a point where the next assignment, which he would find quite hard, would also be dropped. Again, no penalty. In time, his weaker and weaker understanding of what the lectures were about would make it more and more difficult for him to pay attention in class. Eventually, he would see he was not learning much, and facing the continual pressure of outside obligations, he would stop studying, feeling guilty about this, and stop attending class. Again, no penalty would be attached. But what had happened? The student, with no hard feelings on anybody's part, would have flunked himself out. Good. This is what should have happened. He was not there for a real education in the first place and had no real business there at all. A large amount of money and effort had been saved, and there would be no stigma of failure and ruin to haunt him the rest of his life. No bridges had been burned. The student's biggest problem was a slave mentality which had been built into him by years of carrot and whip grading. A mule mentality which said, if you don't whip me, I won't work. He didn't get whipped. He didn't work and the cart of civilization, which he supposedly was being trained to pull, was just going to have to creak along a little slower without him. This is a tragedy. However, only if you presume that the cart of civilization, the system, if you will, is pulled by mules. This is a common vocational location point of view, but it's not the church attitude. The church attitude is that civilization, or the system or society, of whatever you want to call it, is best served not by mules, but by free men. The purpose of abolishing grades and degrees is not to punish mules or to get rid of them, but to provide an environment in which the mule can turn into a free man. The hypothetical student, still a mule, would drift around for a while. He would get another kind of education quite as valuable as the one he had abandoned, in what used to be called the School of Hard Knocks. Instead of wasting money and time as a high-status mule, he would now have to get a job as a low-status mule, maybe as a mechanic, 
Actually, his real status would go up. He would be making a contribution for a change. Maybe that is what he would do for the rest of his life. Maybe he had found his level. But do not count on it. In time, six months, five years, perhaps, a change could easily begin to take place. He would become less and less satisfied with the kind of dumb day-to-day -day shop work. His creative intelligence, stifled by too much theory and too many grades in college, would now become reawakened by the boredom of the shop. Thousands of hours of frustrating mechanical problems would have made him more interested in machine design. He would like to design machinery himself. He'd think he could do a better job. He would try modifying a few engines, meet with success, look for more success, but feel blocked because he didn't have the theoretical information. He would discover that when before he felt stupid because of his lack of interest in theoretical information, he'd now find a brand of theoretical information which he'd have a lot of respect for, namely, mechanical engineering. So he would come back to our degreeless and gradeless school, but with a difference. He would no longer be a grade-motivated person. He would be a knowledge-motivated person. He would need no external pushing to learn. His push would come from inside. He would be a free man. He would not need a lot of discipline to shape him up. In fact, if the instructors assigned him were slacking on the job, he would be likely to shape them by asking rude questions. He would be there to learn something, would be paying to learn something, and they'd better come up with it. Motivation of this sort, once it catches hold, is a ferocious force. And in the gradeless, degreeless institution, where our student would find himself, he would not stop with rote engineering information. Physics and mathematics were going to come within his sphere of interest because he had seen he needed them. Metallurgy, electrical engineering, would come up for attention, and in the process of intellectual maturing that these abstract studies gave him, he would likely be out in other theoretical areas that weren't directly related to machines, but had become a part of a newer, larger goal. This larger goal would not be the imitation of education in universities today, glossed over and concealed by grades and degrees that give the appearance of something happening when, in fact, almost nothing is going on. It would be the real thing. Such was Phaedrus's demonstrator his unpopular argument, and he worked on it all quarter long, building it up and modifying it, arguing for it, defending it. All quarter long papers would go back to the students with comments, but no grades, although the grades were entered in a book. As I said before, at first almost everyone was sort of nonplussed. The majority probably figured they were stuck with some idealist who thought removal of grades would make them happier, and thus work harder. When it was obvious that without grades, everyone would just loaf. Many of the students with A records in previous quarters were contemptuous and angry at first, but because of their acquired self-discipline, went ahead and did the work anyway. The B students and high C students missed some of the early assignments or turned in sloppy work. Many of the low C and D students did not even show up for class. At this time, another teacher asked him what he was going to do about this lack of response. Outweight them, he said. His lack of harshness puzzled the students at first, then made them suspicious. Some began to ask sarcastic questions. These received soft answers, and the lectures and speeches proceeded as usual, except with no grades. Then a hoped-for phenomenon began. During the third and fourth week, some of the A students began to get nervous, and started to turn in superb work, 
and hang around after class with questions that fist for some indication as to how they were doing. The B and high C students began to notice this and work a little and bring up the quality of their papers to a more usual level. The low C, D, and future Fs began to show up for class just to see what was going on. After mid-quarter, an even more hoped-for phenomenon took place. The A-rated students lost their nervousness and became active participants in everything that went on with a friendliness that was uncommon in a grade-getting class. At this point, the B and C students were in a panic and turned in stuff that looked as though they'd spent hours of painstaking work on it. The Ds and Fs turned in satisfactory assignments. In the final weeks, of the quarter, a time when normally everyone knows what his grade will be and just sits back half asleep, Phaedrus was getting a kind of class participation that made other teachers take notice. The B's and C's had joined the A's in friendly free-for-all discussion that made the class seem like a successful party. Only the D's and F's sat frozen in their chairs in a complete internal panic. The phenomenon of relaxation and friendliness was explained later by a couple of students who told him. A lot of us got together outside of class to try and figure out how to beat this system. Everyone decided the best way was just to figure you're going to fail and then go ahead and do what you could do anyway. Then you start to relax. Otherwise you go out of your mind. The students added that once you got used to it, it wasn't so bad but repeated that it was not easy to get used to. At the end of the quarter, the students were asked to write an essay evaluating the system. None of them knew at the time of writing what his or her grade would be. 54% opposed it, 37% favored, 9% were neutral. On the basis of one man, one vote, the system was very unpopular. The majority of students definitely wanted their grades as they went along. But when Phaedrus broke down the returns according to the grades that were in his book, another story was told. The A students were 2 to 1 in favor of the system. The B and C students were evenly divided, and the Ds and Fs were unanimously opposed. Keep in mind the grades were not out of line with grades predicted by previous classes and entrance evaluations. This surprising result supported a hunch he had for a long time, that the brighter, more serious students were the least desirous of grades, possibly because they were more interested in the subject matter of the course, whereas the dull and lazy students were the most desirous of grades, possibly because grades told them if they were getting by. Phaedrus thought withholding grades was good, according to his notes, but he did not give it scientific value. In a true experiment, you keep constant every cause you can think of except one, and then see what the effects are of varying that one cause. In the classroom, you can never do this. Student knowledge, student attitude, teacher attitude, all change from kinds of causes which are uncontrollable and mostly unknowable. Also, the observer in this case is himself, one of the causes, and can never judge his effects without altering his effects. So he did not attempt to draw any hard conclusions from all of this. He just went ahead and did what he liked. The movement from this to his inquiry into quality took place because of a sinister aspect of grading that the withholding of grades exposed. Grades really cover up failure to teach. A bad instructor can go through an entire quarter leaving absolutely nothing memorable in the minds of his class, curve out the scores on a irrelevant test, and leave the impression that some have learned and some have not. But if the grades were removed, the class is forced to wonder each day what it is really learning. The questions, 
What is being taught? What is the goal? How do lectures and assignments accomplish the goal? Become ominous. The removal of grades exposes a huge and frightening vacuum. What was Phaedrus trying to do, anyway? This question becomes more and more imperative as he went on. The answer that had seemed right when he started now made less and less sense. He had wanted his students to become creative by deciding for themselves what was good writing instead of asking him all the time. The real purpose of withholding grades was to force them to look within themselves, the only pace where they would ever get a really right answer. But now this made no sense. If they already knew what was good and bad, there was no reason for them to take the course in the first place. The fact that they were there as students presumed that they did not know what was good or bad. That was his job as instructor, to tell them what was good and bad. The whole idea of individual creativity and expression in the classroom was really basically opposed to the whole idea of the university. For many of the students, this withholding created a Kafkaesque situation in which they saw they were to be punished for failure to do something, but no one would tell them what they were supposed to do. They looked within themselves and saw nothing, and looked at Phaedrus and saw nothing, and just sat there helpless not knowing what to do. The vacuum was deadly. One girl suffered a nervous breakdown. You could not withhold grades and sit there and create a goalless vacuum. You have to provide some goal for a class to work toward that will fill the vacuum. This he was not doing. He could not. He could think of no possible way he could tell them what they should work toward without falling back into the trap of a authoritarian, didactic teaching method. But how could you put on the blackboard the mysterious internal goal of each creative person? The next quarter, he dropped the whole idea and went back to regular grading, discouraged, confused, feeling he was right, but somehow it had come out all wrong. When spontaneity and individuality and really good original stuff occurred in a classroom, it was in spite of the instruction, not because of it. This seemed to make sense. He was ready to resign. Teaching dull conformity to hateful students wasn't what he wanted to do. He had heard that Reed College in Oregon withheld grades until graduation, and during the summer vacation he went there, was told the faculty was divided on the value of withholding grades, and that no one was tremendously happy about the system. During the rest of the summer, his mood became depressed and lazy. He and his wife camped out a lot in those mountains. She asked why he was so silent all the time, but could not say why. He was just stopped, waiting for that missing seed crystal of thought that would suddenly solidify everything.
get back to equal justice. Increase fear and suspicion. Repeat. Let's get let, 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 let's get back to equal justice. Repeat. Let's get back to equal justice. Increase fear and suspicion. Repeat. Increase in, in, increase fear and suspicion. Just do it up. Every encounter is gonna be much more difficult. Repeat. Every encounter is gonna be much more difficult. Repeat. Gentlemen, this. Gentlemen, this. Gentlemen, this is about combat. Repeat. Gentlemen, this. Gentlemen, this. Gentlemen, this is about combat. You have to provide some goal for a class to work toward that will fill that vacuum. This he was not doing. He could not. He could not think of no possible way he could tell them what they should work toward without failing back. Fuck. You have to provide some goal for a class to work toward that will fill the vacuum. This he was not doing. He could not. He could not think of no possible way he could tell them what they should work toward without falling back into the trap of a, th of a th 